In this tutorial, I'll be explaining how to use the Python library HyperSpy, which is a software package used to analyze multidimensional data with a focus on transmission electron microscopy. It can be used to analyze a wide variety of data from electron dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, EDS. You can also use it to analyze holography data and also to do a wide variety of image processing. But for this tutorial, I'll be focusing on the processing of electron energy loss spectroscopy data, abbreviated as EELS. And I'll be doing this using a tool called Jupyter Notebook, which is a very, very practical tool for running code inside a web browser, while also including explanatory text, as we can see here, but also things like formulas and also possibly images. And this notebook here is pretty much the same notebook as you can find in the HyperSpy Demos repository, uh, which you can find at GitHub HyperSpy HyperSpy Demos. And if you want to, you can also run this online, run the same notebook online by going to the binder, which you can see down here. If you click this button, this launch binder, you'll get this web page here after a little while. And if you navigate to electron microscopy, eels, and eels analysis, and if you wait a second, you'll get the same notebook as, as I showed earlier. Then you can follow along and, and run the same code and see how things work. So let's have a look how these, these Jupyter notebooks work. Let's go back to my notebook over here and introduce some basic features. I won't go through all the features because, well, there's quite many of them. But the most important concept, I think, is something called cells. And essentially, Jupyter notebooks are made up of many, many different cells. The main one we see in here is something called a markdown, a markdown uh, cell, which is basically used to uh, display text or uh, formulas, maybe some images. Then, then we have the code cells, which is probably the most important one, because well, that's essentially what uh, enables us to run run the code in in the notebook here. And you can see it's a code cell by firstly the gray background but also the in and the square brackets here. And the way we run the code inside here, there's two major ways. One of them is clicking shift and enter. And you can see it got, got this one number here, which basically means it's, it's the first cell with the first code cell we've run in, in this note, notebook. Alternatively, you can also press the run button up here to run the same cell. So the code cell we just ran was for setting the plotting li library we're going to use. And the next step is to import HyperSpy itself. And we do that down here and we use the import command, which is a very important Python command. And we import HyperSpy's API. And then we call this HS just to make things a bit easier for us later. And then with HyperSpy imported, we can finally get to the interesting part, which is well, actually loading the data and looking at it. So to do this, we use HyperSpy's load command, which is, yeah, we just type hs.load, and then we give it uh, the file path to the data set. And we just save this, this to the variable s here. To visualize this signal, we use the plotting function. And this function is contained within the, the S variable, the S object we, we just loaded. So we can just do shift enter again, and we get this nice little plot here. And this is a pretty standard core loss yields data set with a familiar slowly decaying background here. We have some core loss yields edges up here and another one here. And for those who are familiar with perovskite oxides, they should be able to tell this is a titanium L23 edge. Well, this is the oxygen K edge. And we can drag the navigation line here in the navigation plot using the mouse or by using uh, control plus the right left arrow keys to navigate across, across this, this line scan. And if you go down here in the, in the film region, we see a couple of changes. Firstly, the titanium is gone. The oxygen has changed shape a bit. And also we got two additional peaks. 
one manganese peak, manganese L23, and also a lanthanum peak. So the top part of this, this, this line scan is a strontium titanate substrate, while the bottom part is a lanthanum strontium manganite tin, tin film. And this actually shows us one of the central, I guess, concepts within Hyperspy, which is a separation between navigation and signal access. So one easy way to see this is actually just opening up a new cell and having a look at the signal we just loaded. And now just added a cell by pressing B, which is actually a very handy uh, shortcut. And we, you, if you want to see all the shortcuts, you can uh, go to help and keyboard shortcuts. And A and B, as we can see here, is for inserting cell either above or below your current one. And they're quite handy when, when you're working with, with these notebooks. But yeah, so if you now just type S and do shift enter, we can see some information about the spectrum, about the data we're, we're working on. Firstly, this is an EL spectrum, as expected, this is a core loss spectrum. And back here, we can see the dimensions, dimensions of, the, of, the, of the spectrum, of the signal. So firstly, we have this in the front here, this is the navigation dimension, because it's to the left, to the left of this, this line here. So this tells us we have 10 pro positions in the signal, which looks, looks, uh, looks reasonable. And also we have 512 energy channels, basically, yeah, basically points across the energy axis here. A nice feature for comparing data sets while well, comparing spectrums in data sets is by using the uh, spectrum comparison, which you can get by pressing the E button on your keyboard while have, having this, this plot there selected. And this gives you an additional navigator line. So you can see now we have a blue line and a red line. And you can move this independently of, uh, of each other. So let's say we can place the blue one down here in the tin film and the red one on the top here in the substrate. We can, it, this makes it quite easy to compare different parts of an EELS line scan or an EELS map. Uh, we'll see it's a bit more useful when we have like removed the backgrounds and essentially getting the intensity is about the same. But this is a very nice little tool and it's like semi-hidden. I'm just pressing the E button. Let's first do a relative quantification of the titanium peak. To do that, we first want to remove this, this background here, this parallel back background. And to do this, we use the remove background function, which is in the signal, similar as the plot function. And then we just do shift enter to run this again. Then we get a bunch of stuff. Some UI things here where we can set some settings and the familiar signal plot and navigator plot. And to actually, and the, the main thing we need to specify here is, is where do we want the background to be fitted? that by simply dragging with the mouse, clicking the left, left mouse button, just dragging. Then we get this blue line here, which is the, which is basically the background, the estimation of the background, and also the residual. Basically, how will the signal look like after we remove the background? And then, after we're happy with this, this region here, we go back up here and we press, and I untick the fast button, the fast tick here, essentially to do a full least square fitting of the power law, instead of doing a quick estimation of the background. Then we hit apply, and then we should do some processing, and then we get the results. And this looks looks pretty pretty okay, I guess, with the with the region in front of the titanium here being nice and flat, and which makes it a lot easier to basically quantify the intensity of of the titanium. With the background removed, we use Hyperspy's region of interest functionality to select just the region which contains the titanium peak. And to this, we use the span ROI uh, class, which is found in hs.roi, region of interest. And then we specify the initial position of this span. And then we get an object called ROI. And then we have a plot, plot the signal as we've done earlier. And lastly, we add the signal to the ROI, or rather, we, we add the ROI to the signal. 
And this gives us again a very a span similar to one we had in the remove backgrounds. And then we can simply do this and select this region here. And finally, we use Cyperspy's uh, uh, slicing or cropping functionality, which is called iSig, which is basically slicing or cropping across the single dimension, which here means across the energy loss axis. And then after we, we've done this, we we basically integrate up the, the intensity within this cropped region. And if we hit shift enter to run this, then we can plot it. And as we expected from, from exploring the data earlier, we can see that in the beginning of the line scan, in, in the substrate, we have we have a lot of titanium. Then we get to some interface, and then it drops sharply down to around around zero in the end here the film to the right. It's also possible to do all of this, this, this processing we just did totally non-interactively. If you know where the background region is and if you know where the titanium region is. And let's have a look at that now. And the first thing we do is reloading the signal, basically just assigning it to the same variable called S. This basically overwrites the old signal S with, with the one we just loaded here now. Then we have this very, this very long one-liner here. And the thing we need to know, for instance, is we need to know the signal range. And I know this from before because I've, well, I made this, this notebook. But if, for instance, you want to know how the signal range parameter works, you can use something called doc strings. And one way of accessing them is if you select the function, let's say you select remove background, and you hit shift and tab. On the first click, you get this information here, very, very basic, what, uh, for instance, which, which parameters we have in the function. If you press again, you get some more information where you can scroll up and down. If you click two more times, you get the full doc string explaining how the whole function works. So for instance, here is, here, here is the signal range, uh, parameter and here down here is an explanation showing that the default is the interactive which basically means just uh, just dragging a span as we just did alternatively we can also just input a list or a tuple of ins or floats to set the uh, the, the signal range basically the read the, the background fitting range just just using the command line and these, these doctrines are very, very useful because pretty much every function and every class, every, every object you look at in Python will have this type of, of doctrine. So if you ever wonder what the function does or what kind of parameters it has or what you, can, what you can, can do with a function, this is a very nice tool. And also in quite many, many doctrines, if you go a bit further down, you also get examples on how to on how to actually how to use the function. This is very, very nice. This is a, it's a very nice and excellent tool to use. It's also possible to access these, these, not, these, uh, these doc strings by, for instance, I'm typing s dot remove background and putting a question mark after the function and then executing it. And this gives us, this gives us the same large doc string information as we just saw. So if you now run this, this one-liner here and plot it, you can see that, that the results are pretty similar. This, uh, the results down here are pretty similar to the ones we saw up here. There's some minor differences, which is probably due to slightly different, different uh, ranges, integration ranges and uh, fitting ranges. So this is all well and good, doing it this, this way, by easily removing background and integrating up. But there is a superior way of doing this kind of data processing, uh, which is called a model-based approach, and is based on curve fitting. We start with loading a low-loss data set, which was acquired at the same time as the call-loss data. Then we also reload the, uh, the call-loss data set. The first thing I want to do here is, is looking at the metadata, because for doing this type of quantification, we need some important experimental parameters. You can see them down here, we have the collection angle for the yields data, we have the beam energy, and we also have the convergence angle. For quite many of the data sets, for data types, which can be loaded in HyperSpy, this will be automatically loaded 
the, the metadata here. However, if, if, if it's not loaded for, uh, for your own data, you can also set it using the function called s.setMicroscope parameters. If I look at a doc string here, you can see, yeah, same things. We have the beam energy, convergence angle, and collection angle, which you can set using this little UI. Looking at the low loss signal, we have the, well, the classical features. We have the zero loss peak, the most intense feature here. We also have some plasmon peaks down here. And the first thing you want to do is to align it to make sure that the middle of the zero loss peak is actually centered at zero. To do this, we use the align zero loss peak. And importantly, because we also want to calibrate the core loss data we use the also align function, or well, the also align parameter rather. And the important thing to note here is the brackets and the S. It basically tells the function, you also want to align this signal here inside the, inside the, the brackets here. If we run this, see that something has changed. And we can have a look at the data at the zero speak. And it looks, hopefully, yeah, it doesn't look too bad. It's around the center. Now we need to tell which elements are present in the sample. And we do this using the add elements function here, which is in the core loss S signal. And we add uh, the elements, manganese, oxygen, titanium, and lanthanum, as we saw earlier. Information about these elements are kept in the metadata. If we just look at it here, we can see they're, they've been included and their sample elements. And then we finally get to the, well, the interesting part, which is creating the model and, uh, and feeding it to the data. We do this using create the model, which is also in the S, the S signal here. We run this, and then we can have a look at what's inside the model, because this is very, very vital. Since earlier, I mentioned the model-based approach, and that's pretty much based on, well, firstly, creating a model as we just did, and then having a certain number, one or several components in this model. And constructing this model is very important because, of course, if your model is bad, if you have the wrong components, the fitting will also be, uh, be bad. And here in this model, we can see a bunch of, uh, bunch of uh, components. One of them is a power law back background. We also have core loss edges for each one of the elements we added. In addition, uh, we also added the low loss signal to the model. And this means that every component will be com convolved with the low loss signal. And this is very, very nice for taking into account effects such as plural scattering, which is very common in EELs, especially for, uh, for ticker samples. Then we can finally do well, what, <laughs> what we're here for, fitting the, the model to the data. And we do this using the multi-fit function down here, where as you can just run, and the multi part basically means the model is fitted for every probe position in the line scan. The kind equals smart inside the multi-fit function basically means that we fit the components from lowest to highest energy. And this is very, very nice for doing yields fitting. So it, it will start with the power law, then do the titanium, then the oxygen, then the manganese, and lastly the lanthanum. And now we can actually visualize the result and see how the fitting has gone. And we can see, well, it is fitted somehow. We, we have the power law here, which seems okay-ish. We have, you have some uh, core loss edges here, for instance, the lanthanum in the back. You can see it's a bit of, the, 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 components, the component is a bit too, too high. Also, if you move up to the titanium, you can also see that it, it's overshooting a bit. Essentially, it's, it's over, the intensity is too high in the, in the core loss edge here. We can then visualize the standard deviation for each one of the core loss edges using these two cells here. As we can see, the biggest error is in the uh, oxygen K edge here. Then, the question then becomes, how can we actually improve this? Improve the fitting, because it's obviously not optimal at the moment. The first thing we can do is to change the energy positions of the edges, because these are locked during fitting, because essentially they, 
if they were not locked, they would probably fit extremely badly. One way of doing this is using this interactive enable adjust position function, where we can for instance use drag where we want the edges to be. And we can move down here to get the manganese, for example, and just try to do our best here. We can also do this non-interactively. And to do this, we have to learn about something called parameters. So each component consists of one or several parameters, which is what the, fit, uh, the fitter, the multifit, actually works, works with. For example, if you have a look at the power law uh, component, we can do dot power law dot parameters and see we have uh, the, well, the most important one. So this is the A, the origin and R. Each of these uh, parameters, they can either be, they, they can be locked, they can be changed, the values can, can be changed, or we can basically constrain it to be within certain values. But for now, we're going to set the, the uh, onset energy for the edges to, to some better values. And the first step is doing it for the oxygen KH here, and we run it. Uh, however, this only sets it temporarily and for the current position. To set, this, to set this value for all of the positions, we have to run this assign current value to all function. We also repeat this for the manganese edge. And one important thing to note about the, for instance, the, the L edges here is that L3, L2 and L1, they're locked together. So changing the L3 will also change L2 and L1. So if you now change the manganese L3 onset energy, and then we have a look if we have a look at the manganese L2, we see that this number changed. So you only have to change one of them. Their intensity is also coupled. Another reason for the bad fitting is that the fine structure inside the, uh, the edges are not taken into account. These are the, the very large peaks we saw earlier. So if you just scroll up here, up to the titanium, this is a bit hard to see here, but the very intense, very sharp peaks here, they are not taken into account by the fitter. And the edges will basically try to fit to, to the high peaks and not succeed very well. So what we can do is we can enable, we can use a function enable fine structure. So what this does, it fits a spline to a certain region from the onset of the, of the edge and on a certain width. So let's enable that. We can see the width of this region by going to the component, components.mnl3 and find structure width. So for this component, the width of this region is, uh, is 9 electron volt. Then we can finally get to the fun part, which is actually well, fitting, fitting the model to the data, this improved model. And this will take quite a bit longer compared to the previous fitting. This is mostly due to the fine structure fitting being quite a lot more well, computationally expensive than the more simple fitting we did earlier. It's also possible to do the fine structure fitting a little bit more quantitatively in a way by using individual components for every fine structure feature. For an example of this, you can, for instance, see one of my papers. In this paper, I implemented a method where, where firstly, I set the, the onsets of the edges here a bit more quantitatively, then fitted them to, to, the, to the background here, and then fitting each of the peaks in the titanium edge with, the, with individual Gaussians. If you want some more information about about this this method, you can see the paper on on archive, or and it's also published in in Ultramicroscopy. Now we can have a look at the uh, the new improved model. We can visualize it, and we can clearly see that the fitting is a lot better compared to earlier. Firstly, it's no longer like the, in the background here is no longer way above the, 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 the data. We have also got some nice nice fitting to the, uh, to the peaks here. And this is also very nice for the titanium. 
and even the the background looks actually pretty well looks pretty good so now we can also compare the relative intensities of the edges. We run these two cells and plot. We can see that as expected, oxygen is, is everywhere in this sample. Uh, we have titanium, which is in the first part, and we have lanthanum and manganese towards the end of the, of the line scan. However, there are also some strange things going on here. First, the oxygen is just disappearing up here which is probably just due to a, a slight bug with the uh, setting the Y limits. You can get back in by using the zoom to rectangle uh, functionality down here. Right clicking and dragging a box to zoom out. And here we go. We can see the full oxygen profile. However, there are also some other issues here. The main one being that for manganese and lanthanum in the, in, in the substrate down here, the intensity is actually negative. And that's obviously not correct, as we don't have negative amount of manganese in the substrate. There are several things we can do to improve this. Firstly, we can reduce the manganese L1 fine structure width, because uh, it actually extends quite far, almost into the lanthanum edge. So it uses about half. Secondly, we can set some bounds when we do the fitting. And what I just did is setting the minimum value, the intensity of each of the manganese edges, lanthanum edges and titanium and oxygen edges, the minimum value there to zero. So essentially the fitter can't fit it past zero. In addition, we have to use this bounded equals true parameter when, when doing the multi-fitting. And this essentially forces the, the parameter intensity to always stay above, above zero. And then this should finish running and then we can plot it and see that, well, to be honest, there's not too much of a difference here. But if you have a look in the, we are plotting the line profiles, we see that things have actually changed quite a bit uh, with the auction looking a bit different and also but also the, uh, importantly, the manganese and lanthanum and titanium, they're no longer below zero. It's also possible to analyze a material using the shape of the fine structure to get information about the material. Let's load this data set here, which is a slightly different one than the one we looked at earlier. And in this material, we bombarded the, the middle part of a, of a film here using the electron beam for an extended period of time, essentially inducing a change in the material, changing both the structure and the composition of the film. And this is also an LSMO film, as we looked at earlier. And we can navigate across the line scan to see how it has changed. And you can see there's a change here. If you just look, look in the navigation plot, there's a clear change in the middle. If you follow, for instance, this, this little line, this little pre-peak pre in the oxygen K edge, you can see it take a little turn to the right in the middle here. And you can also just look at the spectra themselves. Go to the middle, we see that the, the secondary peak here becomes quite a lot smaller. If you just navigate using the keyboard now, you can basically see that, yeah, it fits from the top part, it's, it's big. And if we go to the middle, it shrinks back quite a bit and the pre-peak also changes. There's also some changes in the manganese edge down here. It's a bit hard to see just looking at the spectra, but it's a lot easier to see if you look at, at navigation plot. Uh, and while the changes are, are a lot less compared to the uh, compared to the oxygen K edge, there's like a small shift in the main peak here to the left. There's also a change in thickness across the line scan. And we can, we can pretty much see it just looking at navigation plot down here to the lower left, because we can see the intensity has increased quite a bit, the num number of electrons here. You can just, also just move the navigator down and see that the, um, the counts to the, to the top left here increase. We can also see this if we load the, uh, the low loss signal, which was also acquired simultaneously as the call loss data. And if you plot that, we again get the pretty standard uh, sales peak, and we also get get the plasma peaks here. 
And if you move the navigator towards the end of the scan, we also see that it increases. Essentially, the, uh, the plasmon peaks become stronger. So the first thing you want to do here is to aligning, aligning the, the energy axis. Because if we zoom in on the, uh, just on, on the bottom of the cellulose peak here, we can see that it's actually offset by quite a bit, by like almost three electron volt, which is pretty big. So again, we use the same function as earlier, the align zero loss peak, and we si we simultaneously also align the uh, the core loss the core loss data. And now we can yeah we see it got like it uh, found uh, three point five shift, and then we can plot it again, and zoom in on the zero loss peak, and now it indeed looks a lot better. It's pretty much centered. You can also use a low loss sig signal to calculate the thickness of a sample. And to do this, we use something called the uh, log ratio method, where we essentially take the uh, the ratio between the intensity and the cellulose peak versus the uh, intensity of the total spectrum, essentially summing up all the electron counts. And then we're then taking the, the logarithm of this ratio. This is implemented in a function called estimate thickness, where the only thing we have to I guess supply to the function is the threshold of the cellulose peak. And this threshold is essentially the point where the cellulose peak stops. And let's say here, an easy way of doing this is simply zooming in, as I just did, on the on the base of the cellulose peak. And it's finding approximately where it flattens out. And let's say three is a good num number here, which we input in as a threshold. And then we run it. And plotting it, we get this plot where there's a quite obvious change from the beginning, where we have about 0 0.4 up to, to the end, where it's about 0 0.7. And the numbers here, they're in uh, T over lambda. And where lambda here is the inelastic mean free part in this specific material. This, this lambda, this uh, inelastic mean, mean free part, it, it, it's quite different from material, material to material. And for this perovskite oxide, it's somewhere around 100 nanometers, which means that the sample thickness varies from around, let's say, 40 nanometers up to around 70 nanometers, as we can see here. Now, let's have a closer look at the oxygen KH in this line scan. And we start by uh, firstly removing the background to make things a bit make it a bit easier to compare and it's the same as earlier we just use the left mouse button to drag the uh, where we want the background region to be and then we untick past to get a full least square fitting and we hit apply and we get the results down here and now you can see it's a bit easier to compare the different regions here the middle part versus the top part. And now actually the, the trick with comparing a spectrum using the E button, the E keyboard button, is quite nice. Because now we can, for instance, place the, the, the blue marker in the middle, and we can use the red one to, to navigate up and down. And then if we zoom in, we can see there's, we can actually be able to like see more of the, of the small changes. And what's quite obvious here, of course, is the, is the last peak that has changed quite a lot. That changes quite a lot in the middle of, of the line scan here, becoming much smaller. The, uh, the small peak in the front, often called the pre-peak, it almost disappears completely uh, in the middle. We can also have a look at the manganese edge, because there's also some changes there. So zooming in on it and comparing the blue the blue plot here, which is from the middle, and the red one, which is from, from the end, there's a clear shift in the blue plot here. It's slightly shifted to the left. And uh, another effect we can see in this here, in this, this spectra, is the effect of the thickness. So if you move the blue marker all the way to the top part of, of, this, of the spectrum here, of, of the line scan, we can see that the uh, comparing it to the one to the bottom, towards the end, we can see there's a little bit more intensity in the red one, which implies that the sample is a little bit thicker towards the end. One, one way of, of reducing the effects of this, essentially the effect of the thickness here, is to do something called Fourier ratio deconvolution. 
This is also implemented in HyperSpy, and we can use the, the function called uh, Fourier ratio deconvolution. <laughs> and we basically pass the low loss signal to the function, and that should reduce the effects of the thickness by quite a bit. So if we just compare now, we move it to the top, we can move the red one to the bottom again, and then blue one up here. We have now there's essentially almost no dif differences in the thickness in the, in like the back of the intensity of uh, of the background edge here. So let's try to quantify some of the changes we can see in the oxygen K edge. We continue with the non deconvolved signal since we're since we're able to take the player scattering into account using the low loss convolution with the model. And since we're only interested in the oxygen KH here, we get just the region around the oxygen KH. So to do this, we can use the crop signal 1D function, which is a nice little UI function where we can just drag a, drag a span like this around the oxygen KH, and then you see it apply. There we go. Now we have just the oxygen KH. And this is quite nice because this, this means we don't have to zoom in all the time to properly see the small features. And also the fitting, which, we'll, which, which we will be doing very soon, will be a bit quicker since there's essentially less data to fit. Then we can make the model. And uh, since we already removed the background, we use the auto, auto background equal false parameter, which essentially tells the, the function here, the function create model, that we do not want a, uh, a power law component added to the model. In addition, we also add the low loss, sig uh, low loss signal to the model because we want to we want the low loss convolved with all the components as uh, as we did earlier. And since we didn't add any elements, we also ha we basically have zero zero components currently in the model. So the plan now is to fit one Gaussian to each of these three peaks here. And the plan is to do it from the most intense. So we start with this one, the biggest one, then the second most intense one, and lastly the smallest one here, the pre-peak. And the plan is to do this using uh, Gaussians, as these, these peaks are pretty close to Gaussian shape. Firstly, we have to, to create a component. And in HyperSpy, all the components are in hs.model and .components. There's both 2D components and 1D components. For now, we'll just focus on the 1D components, and there are actually quite, quite many of them, uh, a wide variety. There's one special one called expression. We won't use it here, but I think it's nice to just show it. And what's really cool about the expression component uh, is that you can basically make almost whatever whatever function you want in there. Like whatever you can type in and express analytically, you can just write it in there. Uh, so it's quite powerful, but we're not going to use that one. We're going to use the Gaussian, which is already written here. And again, we just make it, and we call it G1, is it, it's the first one. And uh, we append it to the model, just as we would like a standard Add, like, like adding an element to our standard Python list. And now we can see that, yeah, we have a new, we have one component in our model here. Then we fit it over just the, uh, the biggest peak. And to, th to this, we use the function called fit component, which, uh, which works by freezing all the other components in the model setting some reasonable initial values and trying to fit a component over a specified signal range. So for now, we select just the biggest peak in the middle here, like this. And we hit fit, which runs the fitting just for this one proposition, this single spectrum. And here we can actually see the effects of, of adding the low loss signal to the model. Because now these little peaks here, these are essentially due to the, uh, the low loss because you convolve the component, the Gaussian, with the low loss, giving us these, these peaks here, which is essentially uh, the effects of, uh, of the plasmons. In any case, this seems to have worked pretty well. The fitting seem, seems to have worked. 
and then we can remove the only current tick up here to run it for a full line scan. Then we can have a look through the data and see, yeah, this seems to have worked pretty well, especially if there's like an initial, uh, initial fit. By just looking at the uh, at the big big peak picker, we can clearly see that there are some changes go going on just by using our eyes. So it would be interesting to have a look at see how the parameters of the Gaussian change. We can do this using the uh, the plot function on the uh, on the component. So g one dot plot, and the first plot here, that's the amplitude or or the a of the of the Gaussian. And we can see some uh, some changes, which look suspiciously like the uh, the thickness changes, which would kind of make sense because thicker sample means you get more scattering to the oxygen cage. Next, we have the center position, which there's always there's also some changes here, but they're a bit dif different because the center position will typically be less affected by the thickness of the sample. Uh, we see that it's dip here towards the middle of the of the line scan, where where we have these these big changes. Lastly, we have the sigma parameter, which is a measure of the uh, of the width of uh, of the peak. And here again, there's some rather large changes actually go, go going on towards the middle middle of the line scan. But this is still. I guess let's call it preliminary data as we haven't fitted the two other peaks yet. To do this, we make another Gaussian to fit the, fit the second most intense peak. We make it, then we call it G2, since it's the second Gaussian, and then we add it to the model. And we again use fit component, but this time we specify the, the range we want the component G2 to be fitted over. And this is the same signal range functionality as we, we've seen earlier, earlier in, uh, for instance, the remove background. In addition, we fit all of the all, all of the spectrum in the line scan at the same time by setting only current equal false. And then we can uh, plot the model to see how the fit looks like. And well, I guess it looks okay, but not perfect. You can the biggest issue being the the part between the the two big big peaks here. So, but this is pretty much as expected because currently we've only fitted the two two Gaussians separately individually, is one is one at a time. However, if we fit both of them at the same time, it should become much much better. So let's do that now. Before doing doing this, we have to constrain the fitting region a bit, because in HyperSpy with the model here, uh, essentially the blue. If you can see the blue line, that's that's where the fitting will be done. So, for instance, now this also includes this like quite big edge in the back here. So, if we try to do the fitting like this, the fitting will probably go horribly bad, as the Gaussians would try to fit to this large edge as well. To fix this, we use the function called set signal range, and it works pretty similarly as many of the other functions we've used. We just drag, just drag a span over over the the region we want to fit. Then we just hit apply. Then we do the fitting. Then we reset the signal range back to what it was, and we can plot it to see what it looks like. And this should look a lot better, hopefully. And we can see that the the error is much smaller in the middle here between the peaks. In general, it looks much much nicer. Finally, we add the last Gaussian to fit to the uh, the small pre peak. And that's pretty similar as fitting the two other Gaussians. We make the Gaussian, we append it to the model, and we fit it using the predefined scene range. And then we can see, yeah, it's fitted, looks okay, looks good. And then for the for the last step is basically fitting all the three components at the same time. And again, we have to set the signal range, and here we do it non-interactively, specifying the numbers, and we include all the three peaks, of course, a little bit of the region in front, and none of the the big edge in the back here. And then we use a simple multi-fit which is also pretty pretty fast 
and then we reset the scene range and lastly we we plot the the model to have a look at it to visualize the the results we again use the we use m.plot however we add a, a keyword inside here called plot components and this visualizes the individual components within the model and it's quite useful it's like seeing what's go actually what's going on with all the components and this looks pretty good actually um looks to be fitted pretty well Ooh, except for this one here maybe yeah so it looks mostly fine except for this one position in the middle where the pre-peak uh, let's see if we can find it here we go where the pre peak pre-peak has gotten so small that essentially the gaussian the g3 basically there's almost nothing to fit to since the the pre-peak just becomes a shoulder on the bigger on the bigger peak here uh, on the g1 peak let's call it that so that's not ideal uh there's probably many ways of fixing this the easiest probably being adding some some bounds to 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 the gaussian because we haven't used any of that yet uh using b min and b max to keep it within certain values uh maybe maybe for all of them that would probably help quite a bit And now we can finally have a proper look at the at the fitting results. And one one very handy way of doing this is getting the the parameter values as hyperspice signals, since it's possible to use the function called as signal to output a uh, well, as I say, the name says a hyperspice sig signal. So g one a will now be a signal one d, which is a hyperspy signal and what's nice with the signals is you can do a lot of uh, mathematical op operations with, with them so you can for example we can get another signal uh, called g1 g3a for example g3a dot s signal and then we can divide g1a divided by g3a to get a new signal the ratio between the two and for for parameters such as these which are uh, like essentially the intensity of the peak doing the ratio is you is typically very useful as the intensity of a peak can change quite a bit depending on the thickness of the sample or beam current or quite many different different changes so let's try doing this getting a g g1 g3 ratio intensity ratio and plotting it and we can see a quite a big change here, which is, I guess, quite quite expected. We see that the uh, as as we get towards the middle of the line scan, the the, the ratio increases quite a bit, which means that the uh, the G three becomes smaller and smaller, while G three sorry G three becomes smaller and G one becomes bigger, which means the pre peak this which basically makes sense is the pre peak almost disappears while the, the, the biggest peak, the largest peak, becomes larger. The one outlier here be, being the one bad bad position we saw earlier, this one here. Which again, we could probably fix quite easily by introducing some, uh, some bounds to, to the various parameters. Another interesting comparison is the position of the peaks. And since we can clearly see some big shifts, especially in the, in the pre-peak. Again, we can get the center parameter in both the G1 and G3 as signals and subtract them. And then we can see how, how the distance between the two chain changes. And here, there's also quite a big change, as we can see, essentially. Essentially, towards the middle of the, middle of, of the line scan, the distance between the two peak, peaks becomes smaller and smaller, which is, again makes quite a lot of sense from, from, from what we've seen. For this type of analysis, I actually do prefer using center positions as they're way less affected by, by the thickness of a sample or thickness changes or beam current changes as opposed to, let's say, an amplitude or intensity. In addition, by using the, the relative shifts, basically the, the distance between, let's say, the pre-peak and the biggest peak, we do not require a low loss signal to actually calibrate the energy axis which in some cases can be a big advantage. 
And lastly, let's look at the, the sigma between the, the pre-peak and the biggest peak. And plotting it. And we can also see there's a, there, there's a, that's a bit more noisy. There's also like a clear tendency to, towards the middle here with the, uh, with the pre-peak becoming smaller and smaller and the um, largest peak, G1, becoming wider and wider. So this is the end of the, the notebook. If you're interested in uh, trying this on your own, you can use the binder I showed you earlier, which is on uh, Hyperspy demos. And if you go to the binder, click the binder button down here, you can go in here, go on the Acro microscopy, eels, and you start the eels analysis for the notebook here. In addition, you have many others. You have one for doing EDS analysis. You also have one for doing holography analysis. You also have some for uh, the more basics of hyperspy, uh, blind source uh, separation. Uh, you also have one for making uh, for making nice figures, making publication ready figures in uh, using Map.lib and hyperspy. If you want to install hyperspy locally on your own computer, you can head over to Hyper hyperspy's webpage and go to the download link, which gives you various install instructions for how to get it running. The easiest is probably to install it using the Anaconda Python distribution, which works for pretty much every operating system. If you have any questions on how to use Hyperspy, you can go to the Gitter chat, which is gitter.im slash hyperspy slash hyperspy. You can ask questions about like how to use a certain function. If you find any bugs, you can mention it there or basically any type of issues or bugs or things you want to solve data processing. In addition to Hyperspy itself, there are also some Python packages which extends Hyperspy to more data types. One of them is Atomap, uh, which is a library for analyzing atomic resolution TM data. And it works by fitting two-dimensional Gaussians to, to basically every atomic column in images like these here, which, makes, which enables the extraction of information such as ferroelectric polarization or oxygen tilting patterns, as you can see here. Another package is uh, PyXM, which is for analyzing electron precession data. And lastly, there's a library called uh, PixStem for analyzing uh, 4D stem or pixelated stem data sets.